My past is over in you. Well, things are made new. Surrendered my life to Christ. I'm moving, moving forward. What a moment you have brought me to such a freedom. I have found. Good morning. Whether you're with us in person or joining us online, we are glad you are here. It's our hope that as you've joined us today, that you feel the love of Jesus because love gathers here at DCOG. 
We hope you stop by the gathering to pick up some donuts and coffee, grab some books available on the shelf, get some script cards, or just fellowship together. We serve a few of the coffee blends from the local downtown bistro, Java Bean. Pastor Brent calls him The Bean. Along with our house blend, we serve weekly. After you grab something in the gathering, you're welcome to join one of our Sunday school classes we offer for all ages before worship service at 9 a.m. There is nursery care available for newborn through four years old during our Sunday school and church. The nursery is located at the West We offer. morning whether you're with us in person or joining us online we are glad you are here it's our hope that as you've joined us today that you feel the love of jesus because love gathers here at dcog we hope you stop by the gathering to pick up some donuts and coffee grab some books available on the shelf get some script cards or just fellowship together we serve a few of the coffee blends from the local downtown bistro, Java Bean. Pastor Brent calls him The Bean. Along with our house blend, we serve weekly. After you grab something in the gathering, you're welcome to join one of our Sunday school classes we offer for all ages before worship service at 9 a.m. There is nursery care available for newborn through four years old during our Sunday school and church. The nursery is located at the west end of the building. We offer kids church that will dismiss throughout the service. This is for kids ages five through grade four. They sing, hear the message about Jesus and have a really fun time together while they learn. During the week, there are life groups for adults for you to join that meet either here at the church or in their home. Our Purpose Youth Group meet at 6.30 every Wednesday evening. So if you have any kids that are between the ages of fifth and 12th grade, we welcome them to join the fun. Last thing, Please take this time to silence your cell phones. We want to keep from disrupting those sitting around you as we worship Jesus together. Now, one of our ushers gave you a program as you came in that has info and activities going on here at DCOG. However, here are some things we would like for you to be aware of. Our Church of God Daycare, the Leaps and Bounds Learning Center, is looking for people willing to help with the young children that attend here daily. We are looking for people that care about children and want to help nurture and walk aside each of them as they grow. If you have an interest to work or just might want to volunteer to help, please see our new Learning Center Director, Brittany Ward, in our church office. Thank you so much for your consideration of investing in the young lives of tomorrow. The Purpose Youth Discount Cards are back. Our youth will begin to sell them starting today. They are $5 each and will go towards their individual accounts to help with trips such as the upcoming State Youth Convention in Indianapolis and other activities throughout the year. There are items such as 40% off Papa John's, Best One Tire Discount, The Granary Discount, Soul Pig, Monster Pizza, Wings, etc., Pizza King, and many more discounts, up to 15 businesses. You may use them as many times between now and next year, September 30th. They make great gifts for friends and family members, so pick up a few cards from a youth today and thank you for your support of our Purpose Youth Ministry. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. It's our hope that as we draw closer together, we draw closer and worship Jesus, for He is our reason for gathering and deserves all our praise and glory and honor. on this journey getting lost in my mistakes what looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength my story isn't over my story's just begun failure won't define me cause that's what my father does sing with me come on failure failure won't define me cause that's what my father said Stand together. 
when the story isn't over, if the story isn't good, failures never find all when the father's in the room. Sing that last line. Failures never find all when the father's in the room. Have you come this morning to worship Jesus? Put your hands together, come on. Prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Come on, keep your hands going. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. As the door swing wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move. When the Father's in Sing it with me Miracle Miracles take place Cynical time play Love is taking through When the Father's in the room Jericho walk Jericho walks quaking Strongholds now are shaking Love is breaking through When the Father's in the room Love is breaking through Put your hands together, come on. Come on. I want you to sing with me, come on, prodigals. Prodigals come home, come on. The helpless find home. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison door, prison door swing wide. The dead come to life. Love is on the move. morning family man it is good to see you guys this morning it is a beautiful crisp autumn day and we're glad that you're here whether you're joining us in the room today or you're watching online we want you to know that we're glad that you're here and we want you to come with anticipation that that God has something to say to you today in this moment in this time we just pray that you could just for a few minutes lay your burdens down to the side whatever you carried into this place I, I just want you to set it down metaphorically, in your heart, just just lay those things aside, because I believe today God has something to say, and He doesn't want you to pick those things back up when we leave this place. So as we begin this morning, let's just open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we give you this moment and this time. Thank you for bringing us together as the family of God, the people of God. Lord, we just pray that every word that is sung, every uh, 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 word that is spoken, through the reading of your word, God, that you would be present in this place. For you are abundantly good. 
And we are abundantly grateful. Lord, this time is your time, and so teach us what we need to learn. We pray this week as we do every week, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us a heart to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I was growing up in church, we used to sing, my Christ is a firm foundation on Jesus Christ, my Lord. Last week, I was in Dallas for a worship conference, and we did this one. It goes like this. Christ is my firm foundation.
give praise to Jesus. Put your hands together. You may be seated. To the cross I look. To the cross I cling. Of its suffering I do dream. Of its work I do sing. On my Savior, bruised and crushed. Sing it, church. Show that God is love. My God is just. At the cross, you beckon me. Draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I'm sweetly broken, holy church. As a young man in my early to mid-twenties, there was a weekly pattern that occurred in my life from several older men that I looked up to. And that pattern was usually a couple of times a month, we would get together for lunch. 
And I used to just think, well, these are just times for me to get a free lunch when money was tight and these old guys had time on their hands. What else could they do but spend time with this young pup, teach him a few things? It didn't take long before I realized that there was an actual agenda that was a part of these gatherings. The agenda was really just to, A, love me, B, make sure that I knew that they loved me, and third, to help me learn how to make my way through life. Those meals were powerful and important because they shaped me for who I was. It wasn't just that I was having lunch with the most successful real estate salesman in our little community or a retired AU faculty member who was volunteering his time at a church. It was that those men cared about me and they cared about my life and my story and my new marriage. And eventually they would come to care for all of the many children that we have. It's with that mentality that I want us to reflect on the power of communion. Right here today in this moment, we gather at a table, albeit a very big and spread out one, where together as the family of God, we come into the presence of Jesus, where Jesus wants you to know just what Rich Sharp wanted me to know as a young man that I'm here for you, that I love you, and that I want to help you figure out this way of life and how it goes. It's a pattern that was set together in the upper room as Jesus and his disciples rented this room just before the Passover. And with what I have to imagine, some anxiety and electricity in the air, for Jesus knew what was coming, and yet his followers did not. He gathered them together for one last meal, one last opportunity to remind them of what they were called to do. And in that moment, he didn't remind them the highlights from the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't tell stories of the good old days where we were healing thousands of people and folks were coming from every hillside to hear the great and mighty Jesus preach and teach. He didn't even spend that time reminding them of all the tough times where they didn't have a place to lay their head or extra money in their pocket. Instead, what he did was around that table in that moment... He took some bread, and he held that bread out, and he reminded them that that bread represented his body, which would soon be broken for them, and that every time they broke bread, at every meal subsequent to that moment, this was a, this was a mile marker. Every time you break this bread, I want you to remember this moment. I want you to remember the sacrifice that I have made for you. My body will soon be broken. So every time you break that bread, I want you to do so in remembrance of me. And so like them, we will take the bread, which represents the body of Christ, broken for you, and we will eat it. And as the time passes by, I believe the probably uncomfortable moment of the disciples sensing the gravity of what was transpired, thinking, this is it. Jesus is going to be beat up. This has got to be the, the penultimate moment of this meal. And yet, secondarily, Jesus grabs the cup, and he takes it a step further. He says, not only is my body going to be broken for you, not only am I going to be abused and afflicted and arrested, took it a step further, and he said, this cup represents the covenant of my blood, a new covenant for you. What Jesus was reminding them is that he was about to give up his life as a ransom for many. 
And so just like the bread, Jesus said to them, every time you drink from this cup, every time you take this drink, I want you to remember that this is my sacrifice for you. I died the death you should have died so that you can live the life you were always designed to live. And in the same way as the disciples that day, they took the cup and they drank. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment, this moment of communion, this moment of sacrifice. I'm reminded of your infinite goodness. And so, Father, walk with us in the challenging days ahead. And each time we gather together for a meal, may we be reminded that you are here with us and that you love us and that you want to help us live the life you've called us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we're going to enter into our tithes and offerings opportunities. We're going to send them out in a second. So I switched things up, but I neglected to tell Rachel. She can throat punch me later for that. Wait, children's. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'm sorry, Vanessa. The goats are out of here. All right. I want to invite uh, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, come on up, guys. Uh, Daniel, come on up. Come on up. As they're there, some, some, some mature adult, uh, my wife's going, we're safe. That's awesome. <laughs> That's it. Um, as you guys came into the gathering this morning and we enter in um, to this uh, uh, time of, of prayer, you probably noticed some delicious jams there. Uh, and uh, you're going to have an opportunity here to, to maybe um, give uh, and, and purchase some of these amazing jams. But lest anyone here thinks that like we're trying to open up a Whole Foods in the gathering space and just try to take some more of your money. I mean, if you're not going to put it in the offering plate by George, we're going to get it out of your pocket one way or another, right? No, no. Uh, you may see these things, and, and for those of you that are aware, unaware, um, the Bittners have been on a journey um, dealing with, with um, issues, to, uh, preparing to have a child. And so they are embarking uh, on a massively challenging journey of embryo adoption to make this more easy and, and possible. And, and they're not only been praying and been faithful about that, but as you might imagine, um, that's a pretty expensive process. And so we want to provide an opportunity for you. If, if the Lord is laying something on your heart and you want to grab some of these delicious uh, jams and jellies out there, 100% of what you give to that will go right back to the Bittners to help them on this journey. And so I'd just encourage you over the next several weeks, if you have a chance, go grab some jelly um, and uh, uh, support this wonderful family. But even more important than that, in our prayer time this morning, I, I just want to pray for them. And so um, we're just going to gather together. If you want to come up and, and, and pray with us and pray for them in this journey, um, anyone that has struggled with infertility or, or issues of, of having birth, we know it can be a very challenging season where it drains you emotionally, physically, and that's hard. And so we just want to love this family. We want to let them know that we're here for them in this journey. And so um, we're just going to pray for them, and then uh, Vanessa's going to have to go wrangle those 300 kids that just ran out of here. So, all right, let's pray. Father God, I just pray for Vanessa and I pray for Daniel and I pray for their life. Lord, you know the struggles, the frustration that has been present as they've been attempting to, to have a child. And so, Father, we just trust them to your care now. We know that you are the ultimate author of life. And so we even pray right now in Jesus' name that you would begin this story, that you would speak life and speak hope and speak peace into this family, into their marriage. And Father, that if it be your will, Father, you would just place a brand new beautiful life right here, right now in this moment. So Father, we pray for them in the days and the weeks and this journey that is long ahead of them. We know that you are faithful. We know there are going to be hard days ahead and good days ahead. And so, Father, we pray that you would lift them up on those high days and that they would experience joy unspeakable. But, Father, we also know in the challenging days that are ahead, there will be moments of frustration and anger and depression and anxiety and uncertainty. And, Father, we pray all the more that you would be with them in that journey. Lord, help us as their church to love them well. 
Help us to be there for them, both in in physical, real, tangible ways, but also emotional and spiritual ways as we pray for them more than just this moment in time, but as the weeks and months go forward. Lord, we thank you for this family and for the gift that they are to our ministry as they teach and lead our children and our youth. Father, would you bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If there are any other kiddos that are still left, you can head that way now. So when... God parted the Red Sea, the Israelites thought they were done. They were going to die. Then God parted the waters and made a way for them. Too many things up here this morning. All right. 
Well, this morning we wrap up our current sermon series, the last sermon we've got here in our Criticizing Jesus series. And uh, I hope that you have learned a little bit about how Jesus addressed criticism in his time and how that might relate to you in your life as you inevitably will face criticism from time to time. I think that Jesus laid us out a, a beautiful blueprint, and we sort of closed this series with, a, with an amazing example and a huge challenge that Jesus faces uh, uh, in this moment, but also it's a challenge that kind of we face, although in a different kind of a context. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like you to turn with me to Mark chapter 2. We're going to be beginning in verse 23. If you don't have a Bible, you're always uh, welcome to download the Version Bible app from the App Store. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful app that, that allows you to have countless uh, variations of God's Word. But the other cool thing is you can go to the live events tab there. There, and you'll have my sermon outline and my notes there so you can uh, uh, write back and forth and, you know, uh, keep yourself uh, uh, entertained as I blather on here for the next 20 or so minutes. God's Word says this, beginning in verse 23, it says this, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, His disciples began breaking off the heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the Scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abathar was the high priest, <coughs> excuse me, and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was not made to meet the needs of people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath, chapter 3. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was on the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or destroy it? But, of course, they wouldn't answer him. So he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their heart, and then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot and to kill Jesus. So once again, we see Jesus facing a little bit of a criticism here. You see, the reality is part of what Jesus ran into often is that he was what I would call a disruptor. Jesus was aggressively a disruptor. He did not ascribe to the norms and the policies of those that are around him. That's often the case of why so many of the religious of the days failed to see Jesus as the Messiah. It was because Jesus did not look, act, and behave in ways that they thought the Messiah should look, act, and behave. You see, they had a very certain criteria of a very certain life, of a very certain background of the types of things the Messiah would do, namely that he would come in as a conquering king and overthrow Rome, that he would be ultimately Jewish, which means that he would reflect and live out the laws of the time, and that he would do exactly what they wanted him to do. Because, of course, they were the experts. We see it time and time again throughout the New Testament story, throughout the parables of Jesus, that he failed to live up to the expectations of those that, quote, knew better. You see, that's the reality of Jesus. He was a disruptor. He was one who regularly disrupted the patterns of normal and proper behavior. And so as a result, he was often criticized. This is no different than what we're looking at in these two stories. We see oftentimes Jesus ran afoul of the leaders on the Sabbath, 
right? This was the non-negotiation day in the life of Israel. You see, of all of the rules and regulations, which started with ten, right, and those ten commandments at the time of Jesus, those laws somewhere number around about 2,000, give or take a few hundred. And most of those rules were a little bit flexible. You could have a little play in them. But the Sabbath was one of those that no matter where you ended up on the Jewish continuum, you held it as holy and you did not work. This rule was so hard and fast that for most places in America, clear through about 1970, we had these things that we called blue laws, right? Where everything was closed on Sunday. Because Sunday was a day that you didn't work. Now, most of these places weren't Christian places. They weren't doing it for religious reasons. But yet, this pattern of history lent itself through thousands of years that even this policy remained in place. Now, here in Decatur, I, I, I often tell folks that visit us here on a Sunday, we have like light blue laws here which means only like half the stuff in town is closed on Sunday. So somebody comes in from out of town, they go, well, where are we going to eat today? I'm like, well, you got fish or you got fast food. Those are your options. You pick which one you want, and that's what we're going to do. Maybe, yeah, we could throw some Mexican in there. You're right. We can throw a little bit of Mexican food in there as well. You drive through downtown Decatur, and boy, it's all shuttered down. Because we still live in a community that's small enough, that's family-oriented enough, that people realize that there's a good connection to be made of just taking some time off. And so that's what we find Jesus here in this moment. We find him being criticized for doing a couple of things, breaking the heads off of grain and eating it in the field. Can you imagine such an outrageous thing to be angry about, right? Right? that you would be so angry that you're working. They have created a definition of work that was so stringent that simply breaking the head off a stalk of grain was considered work. Now, they weren't out there harvesting. As a matter of fact, the whole reason that Jesus was allowed to do this is as was the custom in Israel at this time, a farmer would only harvest a portion of his field. He would often leave portions of that field open for those that were passing through, those that were foreigners or strangers or didn't have money. They would leave a little bit on the field so that they could help themselves. It was a wonderful system. And so Jesus, walking through one of these fields that's been harvested, he snaps off this head of grain, and the argument commences. I want to make an observation as we get to the onset here, and this is this. Here's observation number one. Sometimes in an effort to be keepers of the truth, we forget the real truth, okay? I want us to think about this because this is a uniquely modern church dilemma. Because if we believe what we believe, the reality is the local church is the greatest hope of the world in a modern society. We are the hands of feet. What do I say almost every week without exception here? Be Jesus what? Where you live, work, and play. The reality is the local church is the beacon of salvation in a local community. We are the ones who are tasked with being the hands and feet of Jesus. And just like any other individual who is given a little bit of power, sometimes that power can go to our head. It's not just an adult problem, mind you. I have teenage daughters. And occasionally we call on those teenage daughters to watch their younger siblings. Maybe you did something similar in your house. Well, it doesn't take very long, at least in our house, to go from being an advisor who's assisting and caring for their siblings, to being an additional parent. I can't tell you the number of times, my girls probably could, right, where I simply say to them, I don't need your help here. Because inevitably I'll be disciplining one of the boys or going through, and all of a sudden, you know, just like the kid on the periphery of the fight who actually isn't in the fight, who's like, yeah, that's right, yeah, you better do that thing, yeah, I already told you to do it, I have to stop and go, hey man, I don't need your help, I've got this covered, I can figure it out from here, I have done this enough. 
You see, what's happened is, uh, rightly, they've got a little bit of ownership in there, right? They're doing a good job by caring for their siblings, so they have some ownership, and that ownership is good. We want that. We don't want them to just let the boys go get run over on 500 when somebody's tearing through the stop sign, right? But what inevitably happens is that when you give a little bit, all of a sudden, over time, that little bit of authority becomes a whole lot of authority, and then they're bossing them around the house. Friends, this is exactly what happened in the nation of Israel. God said, these are my Ten Commandments. You are my people in the world. You will be the nation through which I reveal myself. That's why they were, quote, chosen. They weren't chosen because they were better or smarter or more dependable and that they were the only people that were going to get in to heaven. They were chosen because God chose them to be a vehicle of his loving grace. And here in the time of Jesus, we find that the the nation of Israel has sort of become like the 16-year-old older sister. Yeah, Jesus, you don't get to eat that whenever you want to eat that. That's work. Yeah, Jesus, you don't get to heal in the temple. That's working on the Sabbath. God doesn't allow that. Meanwhile, God's saying, hey, hey, I got this. I'm in charge here, remember? Unless we look at the story And we stand on the outside and we say, oh, man, the nation of Israel, what a bunch of dum-dums, man. They had everything. They got to part the Red Sea. They got to see the miracles of miracles. They got to see Elisha and Elijah. They got to be a part of this journey where God literally redeems them from bondage. This is so stinking cool. How could they ever get it wrong? And yet they did. But when we look around at the world in which we live today in 2022, we see that in a lot of ways the church kind of done the same thing, right? We've sort of become that nation of Israel mentality, right? Yeah, man, you can't do that stuff. God doesn't allow those kind of things. We're going to tell you about it. You see, the reality is for us, we are keepers of the truth. We are the ones who are tasked to be light and life in Adams County. But the reality is we are not the truth, you and I. We are not the arbiters of the truth, you and I. We are communicators of the capital T truth, which is the gospel of Jesus. That's what gets precedent. That's what gets power. And there may be moments in our life where we are put in positions where the people that we're reaching do not connect directly with the things that we ascribe to, and the worst thing that we can do is what Israel did here and said, nay, nay, you can't do that. We have to continue to ask the redemptive questions of who Jesus is and who Jesus is calling us to be in our local community context. And that means that we often will come into conflict with the world around us. That's inevitable. Anytime you live your life according to God and not according to man, you will, will, will come in conflict with those two worlds. And so the reality for us is not that we're never going to come into conflict. The question is, how do we deal with the conflict? That's what the criticism of Jesus in the story is illustrating for us. It's not that they didn't have the right to question Jesus. They certainly did. The question is how they react to Jesus. And so for us, as we look at the world today and we look at everything that is afflicting our world, every ideology that you can think of, every type of ism, that you can think of. These are all in conflict of who God is and who God is calling us to be. So we have to stand for the truth, but we have to do so in such a way that we don't alienate those from ever wanting to hear the truth. Does that make sense? You see, it's for us the ability, right, to say hard things without being hard. It's the ability to hold accountability without becoming angry. And this is a challenging thing, right? To disagree without becoming disagreeable. That was the crux of Jesus' ministry. It's what amazes me the most. Right? Jesus daily was confronted with these realities. And yet somehow, every day, we read from Scripture accounts that people were drawn to him like a magnet. There was something about him. He wasn't wishy-washy, by the way. He wasn't just like, yeah, whatever you want, man. It's all good here. That's not who Jesus was. And yet people were still drawn to him. It's because Jesus often said, come to the Father through me. 
That's the difference. Jesus always pointing to the Father. Even in hard conversations, even in frustrating moments, even when great uncertainty looms on the horizon, Jesus is always pointing to someone that isn't him, which is outrageous because he's the son of God. <laughs> you see, for us, that's the challenge. How do we keep the truth without forgetting the truth? How do we hold firm to what God has called us to, to be faithful followers of Jesus? But how do we do so in a way that loves those that are around us. As you read on here, we see that that Jesus is being questioned, right? He's being questioned about eating grain on the Sabbath. We see that he's being questioned as it relates to healing a man in the temple. And it leads us to this observation that I want us to think about, and it's this. Don't spend your life looking for gotcha moments, okay? Okay? Don't spend your life looking for gotcha moments. Man, I have a friend who seems to live for the gotcha moment, where he is always trying to catch me in, "Ah, I got you, I got you, Brent. You see, that was an incongruent decision you made. You say you're about this, but you're over here talking about that. Well, what's that? I got you, buddy. I got you right there. See, you're a hypocrite. To which I usually responded, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely, I'm a hypocrite. Everybody is at some point. No one on the planet can live 100% of the way that they want to live 100% of the time. It's silly to believe that. Everyone has a moment where we fall short, where we feel disconnected from the thing that we're supposed to be doing, and that's okay. The reality is you have to continue to strive to not be that way. But there are going to be moments where you're going to be hypocritical. And it's an instructive and teachable moment, by the way, where you can say these magical words, I'm sorry. They're amazing words. Occasionally, I've even had to say these words, which are much more challenging, I was wrong. I mean, I don't say those a lot because I rarely am, of course. But other people are definitely wrong. But in those moments where I'm able to go, you know what, that was on me. That was my mistake. That, I, I'm sorry for that. That can be hugely healing to folks. Hugely healing. When you have a moment where you just acknowledge that you're not fallible. Or that you are fallible. You're not infallible. That's what I think Jesus wanted these religious leaders to say at some point. He just wanted them to say, Listen, we're not perfect either, Jesus. The problem is they never said it. (laughs) They always seemed to insinuate that they were in fact perfect, that they were in fact always right, that they were in fact always a part of those that were on the right side and he was always on the wrong side. For us, we cannot spend our life looking for gotcha moments in other people. We cannot always be looking to set the trap Because often what happens for us in our life is that we end up in a Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner cartoon. Where oftentimes the people that we're trying to catch are the roadrunners. See, we always think that we're the roadrunner. But the reality is we're we're Wile E. Coyote most of the time. We set the trap and then we get caught by it. We're the one that paints the, you know, the mural of the train tunnel on the, on the wall, and we think, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to watch them just get it. And then they zip through, and you're like, well, how did that happen? It must be a tunnel. I'm not sure how. And then you slam right into it. You see, that's what happens when you live life looking for a gotcha moment, looking to find some incongruity, looking to find someone who's falling short of the measure, looking for somebody whose life and house isn't in order the way that you think it should be in order. The reality is we must retain the heart of Jesus where he, yes, calls out the incongruities, right? That's what Jesus did here. That's what I love. Of all of the five critiques that we looked at Jesus, this is the one that he responded to. This is the one that I love. Passive-aggressive Jesus maybe is my favorite Jesus in the Bible. Anytime Jesus says, have you never read? Have you not heard? 
Has it not been taught to you? That's Jesus saying to these people, hey, are you stupid? That's what I, I love that. I, I love that Jesus is saying, listen, if you're so smart, if you know all the things, if you know what's going on here, shouldn't you know this story, big boy? Shouldn't you know about King David not only picking grain, but he went right into the temple and he ate that sacred bread that was just for the priest. Boy, I don't hear you talking about old King David in bad terms, do we? No, no, King, King David was the greatest king we ever had. He was a man after God's own heart. We'll forget about that Bathsheba nonsense and killing her husband and all that, you know. This is okay, though. And so what he's saying is this. If God was okay with David going into the Holy of Holies and eating sacred bread, you don't think he's going to be upset if my disciples snap off a few heads of grain here and have a little bit of something to eat? I love that. I love that Jesus wasn't just willing to lay down. He wasn't just willing to just take it and say, oh, guys, you're right. I guess you're right. We often in the church want to paint Jesus in two particular ways. We either want to serve the Jesus of the temple and the money changer days. For those of you that are unfamiliar, there's several famous moments where Jesus walks into the temple, his father's house, and literally chases out humans with whips. Yeah, let's go. Now we're talking. That's a tough, rugged, manly Jesus. That's the Jesus I want. Or we want to serve the Jesus of the little children. Meek, soft, Mild Jesus, let the little children come unto me and do not keep them from me, for such are the kingdom of theirs. Oh, I love Grandfather Jesus. Yeah, Grandpappy Jesus is the best one. He's soft. He probably has a gray beard at that point. He's got nice, soft, gentle hands. He's, he's grabbing the kids. But the reality is Jesus is a little bit of all those things. He is grandpappy Jesus, but after all, he was a carpenter by trade, so you better believe those hands were calloused and dirty and cracked. The same Jesus that can gently hold a baby is the same Jesus that with his bare hands chased other grown men out of a temple. And so let us not be confused that this Jesus who is rebuking these guys is doing it as a passive loving papal. He's doing it as the Son of God who is illustrating a powerful point, and that powerful point is this. God is God, and you are not. God is God, and you are not. Matter of fact, before we go in, let's just do a little, let's just do a little, little, little call and response. We don't do this in this church, so we'll see if you guys are, you know, you pick it up. Um, I'm going to say God is God, and I am not, right? So we're going to do that together on the count of three. God is God, and I am not. Ready? One, two, three. God is God, and I am not. That's good. That's good. Let's do it one more time, right? One, two, three. God is God, and I am not. I want you to put that in your pocket, okay? You're not God. I'm not God. God is God, right? It's one of the earliest and easiest lessons we can learn. It's what Jesus is teaching them in this moment. Listen, God is God, and you are not. If God says it's okay for me to do this, by George, I'm going to do it. And it doesn't matter, matter much to me whether you like it or not. That's sort of irrelevant. God has called me to it. I'm going to do it. And how you respond to it, well, that's between you and God. And so that's the reality for me that I had to grab early in my life. I, I'm not God. If I were God, we would do things differently. Better, probably. Because I would do what I wanted to do. But the reality is, I'm not. And so I have to serve God as faithfully as I can in my fallible humanity where I don't always get it right and I don't always measure up the way that I want to measure up. But the reality is, the moment I let loose of having to be the answer for everything, to have to be the smartest human in the room at all times and in all places, there was a great freedom that erupted in my life. A moment where I realized that I didn't have to carry the weight of perfection. Jesus did that for me. And that is a freeing moment. As we wrap up here, what I want you to think about is the ending of the story, which I love. When he's in the temple, 
And they're trying to figure out, is he going to let this guy, is he going to heal him? Is he going to do something demonstrative? I I love how Jesus does this healing, by the way. He does this. He says, uh, hold out your hand. (laughs) Do do we see here where Jesus like laid his hands on him and prayed and said some kind of magical phrase, you know? No. Jesus just says this, hold out your hand. And it's healed. Think about that. Your whole life, you, you, you've been crippled, you, you've been disabled. And in that moment, Jesus just says the words, just says the words, hold out your hand. And you hold it out, and it is whole, and it is well. And in that moment, this is the other observation I want you to make. Oftentimes, God wants to use our story to help tell his story. Today, friends, I want to tell you this. You have a story. Your story is important. It's important to you and it's important to God, but most importantly, it's important to the gospel ministry of this church. You have a story, and your story matters. And what God might be calling you to at some point in your life is to share your story so that his story becomes famous. You see, in that moment, that crippled man had a life-changing story where everywhere he went, every meal he partook in, every Sabbath when he worshiped in the temple, he could remind people that I once was broken and now I'm healed. Friends, you have a story. Now, maybe yours isn't about a crippled hand. Maybe it's about a crippled heart. Maybe you resonate with amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Maybe that is your story. Maybe you you look back and you say, man, my life was a mess before Jesus, if I'm honest. And this is it now. But guess what? Your story doesn't have to be big and demonstrative. There doesn't have to be a healed hand. There doesn't have to be a, a Paul scales falling off. You don't have, have to have been a drunk and, you know, been married seven times or been in, addicted to drugs and narcotics. You didn't have to be in a street gang. Your story is powerful all on its own. Your story. You're just good old-fashioned, boring, Midwestern American story. Because to somebody else, that story is inspiring. We often think so little of ourselves. We think our life and the sum total parts of it are irrelevant to anyone else. No one cares. No one could benefit. But the reality is, your story matters. Because your story is tied to God's. So I would encourage you to share that story because God might be attempting to use your story to tell his story. So what's our big idea today? It's this. Loving God and loving others is more than a spiritual goal. It is the way of Jesus. It is. Loving God and loving others. It's not just a platitude. It's not a spiritual endeavor. It is the actual reality of our life. It is what we were created to do, to love God and to love others. It is literally our manifest destiny Oftentimes when people come to me and say, Pastor, I'm I'm trying to figure out God's will for my life. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wondered, does God have something for me? Does God have something he wants me to do? And I usually start with this question. Are you following the will of God that has already been clearly defined in Scripture? And they say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I say, before God's going to give you a a, a big dream, right? Before God's going to give you some kind of other will in your life, he's going to will you to do something else. Before God gives you that, he's going to ask you, have you done the bare minimum first? When our kiddos want to go and spend some time with friends, we don't talk about, you know, what their grades are. We don't talk about if their big, massive chore list has been done for Saturday, if it's on Tuesday. We start with a simple question. Is your room clean? And if the answer is yes, then we move on to other questions. If the answer is no, then it's go clean your room and then we'll talk. Well, but I mean, once I get it clean, can I go? No, no, that's not what we're doing here. You're going to clean it first, and then we'll talk. 
So what you're saying is, God, I need to know your will for my life. I, I want to know what you're calling me to. I want to know what you have in store for me. I want to I want to change the world for you. I'm so excited. And God is going to say the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is likened unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the greatest commandments. These two things sum up the entirety of God's word, all of it. All of it, every moment, every sentence, every miracle, every healing, every death, every resurrection, everything on the planet is wrapped up into loving God and loving others. And so before we seek God's ultimate will, whether it be in your personal will or the will of the Decatur Church of God as we seek to carry out God's mission, God is saying to you today, are you doing what I've already told you to do? You see, he's wanting to know, did you clean your room? Before we talk about anything else, did you clean your room? Are you loving me with everything that you have? And are you loving others? Once you can do those two things, then we'll talk about what else you get to do. You see, that's where it begins with us. It's not just a platitude. It's not a spiritual discipline. It's not like having a daily quiet time or praying. No, those are the things that define who we are and how we're called to serve the world. Love God, love others. That is where it starts and it ends. And until we can do those two things, God is going to withhold his blessing, friends. He will withhold his blessing in the same way that we withhold the privileges that our kids are attempting to get until they do what we've asked them to do. I think we as a church have gotten lazy I think that we've forgotten about those things. I think that we have made other things more important than that. Whether it's hard work and serving in a ministry or doing an outreach event or or being politically engaged or whether it's attempting to make lasting impact in our community, all those things are good. All those things are affirmed by God. All those things are things that God is calling us to. But if we fail to love God and love others, then we are doing it on our own. And we can't do that. Remember why? Because God is God and I am not. So we have to begin at the foundation. We have to begin at the most important part. Here are questions this week. Big question one. Spoiler alert, I already gave you the answer. What is the most important commandment from God and what is the second? That's question one. Question two, is it easy or hard to keep those commandments? And why do you feel that way? Be honest. Is it easy or hard? Big question three, which one of those two do you struggle with the most and why? I want you to wrestle with these questions because our answers to these questions define who we are as a church collectively, big C. Our answers to these questions determine whether God will bless us or not bless us. You've got to wrestle with these things inside, and there's no easy answers, friend. There's no, there's no Sunday school Jesus, Holy Spirit, you know, type answers, right? You know, when you're in Sunday school, if you, you know, the answer was always going to be Jesus or Holy Spirit, right? You knew it. It's going to be one of those. Teacher, I, oh, what's this? Answer that. Oh, it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's the answer. These questions are hard. They're simple to understand, right? It's super obvious. Well, duh. But the reality is to live them, man, that's challenging. That's, whole, that's hard, right? Loving your neighbor is easy in theory. Loving them in reality can be much harder, right? Some of y'all are hard neighbors to love. My neighbors probably hate me. My dog will find a ball that belongs to you, and she will steal it. Matter of fact, about a month ago, she came home with a cat dish. We don't even own a cat. I, I don't know what neighbor she stole it from, but somebody's cat is hungry because our dog is a thief. So I get, we're maybe a little bit hard to love as neighbors. But the reality is, you got to love them. You got to do it. So what's our next step? Next step is this. I want you to ask yourself this question. In what ways this week... Can I reveal the power of God in my life to others? What way can you do it? What tangible way? I'm looking for a tangible, practical expression this week. 
what ways can I reveal the power of God in my life? I mean, probably none of you have the gift of miraculous healing, so I'm guessing none of you will be repeating the story in the Scripture today, you know, down on 2nd Street in Madison, you know, you know, straightening out some hands or something. But maybe, who knows? But there is something that God wants to do this week through you. He wants you to bless someone. He wants you to be a blessing to someone. He wants you to have a tangible expression of goodness and love. And so I want you to pray about that this week. As the team comes forward, we're going to close uh, in prayer. Father God, you are abundantly good, and we are so thankful for who you are. We're thankful, God, that you call us to be light in life in dark places. And Lord, we acknowledge the world today is a dark place, and we need your light. And we need your life. And so, Father, I just pray that this week we would hold these messages together, this call to love you and to love others, this call to respond with criticism, with grace and understanding, but also with truth. That, God, you are calling us into a mission field where the workers are few and the harvest is plentiful. Lord, as our literal community is transitioning into a season of harvest, may that be a visual reminder. Every, every highway and county road that we drive down that once was beans is now as dirt. What once was corn is now mowed down stalks. Lord, may that be a visual reminder that the harvest is upon us. May we be looking like farmers to the field of our life and asking, the seeds that I planted, are they ready yet? Are they ready to be harvested yet? Or do they need another couple of weeks or a month or a year? Lord, help keep our spiritual eyes open. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this last song, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe God's doing a little bit of something in you. Maybe you hear this message this morning and you go, yeah, man, Brent, that is, dude, that is right. I want this life you're talking about. This Jesus sounds totally amazing. And I've been walking down my own road, and I don't want to walk down that road anymore. I want to walk with him. I want to give you a couple of opportunities. The altar to my left, to your right, is just an altar you could just come to and pray. No one's going to bother, bother you. No one's going to talk to you. No, no one's going to be, hey, what are you up here for? You could just come up here and just do some business with the Lord, just you and the Lord. This altar to my right and to your left, this is one that's going to be open. If you just want somebody to pray with you, say, Pastor, I'm going through something, or I need to know more about Jesus, or I need a change, or I just need someone to pray for me because I'm anxious, i got a surgery coming up, or, or whatever's going on in your life, I want you to have that opportunity to respond to this altar here. My encouragement is this. If God is working on you today, would you listen? Would you listen to that still, small voice? Oftentimes, can I be honest, I hear it. And I ignore it. And I say, ah, maybe next week. Maybe, maybe later. Maybe this week I'll email the pastor, see if he wants to get together for some coffee. We could talk about it. Those are all good things. But when that spirit is saying, no, 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 I, I want to talk to you today. I just encourage you, man, respond. There's going to be a freedom in laying down that weight and just saying, God, I'm here. I don't know the answers, but I know you do. And so give you that opportunity to respond. If the Lord's laying that on your heart, please respond. Love came down and rescued
Father. I mean, oh, okay, I turned it off like a big dummy. You'd think by now I'd know how to work this microphone. You know, one of the things I love about this church is how faithful you are to serve. And we serve a lot of various ministries in our community. And so these purple bags represent one of those ministries. And a representative of that ministry, Jeannie, is here this morning. And so as we get ready to pray over these bags, can you just... Can you just share with our people what these bags mean? They're not just stuff in a pretty purple bag, but what do they represent? These bags are going to be presented, and 24 of them actually already have been, to the Adams Wells Crisis Shelter. Unfortunately, we have women in our community that are forced rather emergently out of their home environments due to circumstances that are unforeseen. And so it is hoped yeah. that with the contents of the bags, which can, uh, are largely hygiene items, maybe a hairbrush, toothbrush, toothpaste, when you're thinking about leaving that unsafe environment, you don't think about anything but 
what's on your back. And so uh, with the contents of these items, we're extending our love to those individuals, praying that they're starting a new life. And also contained in the bag is a Bible. Mm -hmm. So along with these, 24 have been presented and we'll be taking the remainder of them over this week. Yeah. So those of you that might want to pray over the bags uh -huh. with those of us, thank you for the many that have contributed. Yeah. You're a blessing to them. Yeah. These are the tangible expressions of faith that we have as a church, right? People are always asking, what can I do? What difference does my life make? This is one super easy, tangible way to be the hands and feet in a moment where someone is feeling the most vulnerable. This towel that they use, the toothbrush that they grab is a tangible reminder that someone, somewhere, is thinking of them. And what of a more comforting feeling that would be in the midst of crisis where up is down and left is right and your whole world you feel like is coming apart at the seams to know that even in that moment, somebody's got you. And so as we close this service in lieu of a normal dismissal benediction, what I'd invite you all to do is kind of stand with me here. And instead of having everybody come up and causing a massive traffic jam, I'd like you to just extend a hand out towards these bags. Just as a representative, man, we're just praying for these bags and the lives in there that, that we want them to know the love of Jesus. And I'm going to pray, and at the conclusion of our prayer, you'll be dismissed from this place. Let's pray. Father God, every bag at this altar represents a life, a life in chaos, a life of uncertainty, maybe fear. And Father, we want you to replace that fear with love and that anxiety with hope and with that story with redemption. And so Father, we pray for these bags and the lives that they will be touched. We pray, God, that you would allow us to be light and life and love to these individuals. That even in the moment of their most stern anxiety, there would be a breath of peace and a calming of be still in this moment. May you use these bags to change the lives of these people. And Father, may you use these bags as a gentle reminder to us that we are always called to be light in life where we live, work, and play. No gesture is too small. Father, everything done in love is done for the gospel. So bless these bags, bless these families, and more importantly, bless this community with the love of Jesus. We thank you and praise you for this day and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Be well, friends. We love you. You are dismissed. We'll see you next week. Amen.